Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 149, Dr. Larry Hurtado's Destroyer of the Gods, Part 1. Dr. Larry Hurtado is Emeritus Professor of New Testament Language, Literature, and Theology at the School of Divinity at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. The author of many scholarly articles and reviews, his books include Lord Jesus Christ, Devotion to Jesus and Earliest Christianity, How on Earth Did Jesus Become a God, The Earliest Christian Artifacts, Manuscripts and Christian Origins, and God and New Testament Theology. He's perhaps best known for his book, One God, One Lord, Early Christian Devotion and Ancient Jewish Monotheism, the third edition of which came out in 2015. He also shares his thoughts on recent scholarship with the wider public at his blog at larryhurtado.wordpress.com. He's here with us today to talk about his latest book entitled Destroyer of the Gods, Early Christian Distinctives in the Roman World. Dr. Hurtado, welcome back to the Trinity's Podcast. Thank you for having me. Good to be back. Dr. Hurtado, modern people in the Western world tend to think of religion as essentially a private matter, something one freely chooses and is closely connected with moral behavior. Is this how most people thought about religion in the first century? Not really. If we look at the larger Roman religious environment, uh, most people thought of what we would call religion. By the way, we can come back to this, but I mean... That category of religion is a modern category. It's not an ancient category. Mm -hmm. But what we mean by religion, that is something to do with divine beings and so on. Most people in the ancient world thought of religion and the gods as involving mainly sacrifice and what scholars call cultic actions or ritual actions designed to secure the favor of this or that deity or express thanks to this or that deity for answered uh, placation. You didn't turn to religion in order to learn how to live. You turned to tradition, or in the Greek and Roman world, if you were part of more of a thoughtful class, you would turn to philosophy to consider how you live your life. You know, principles of behavior or ethics or right and wrong or whatever. Philosophy, but not religion. The exceptions to that, and to my mind, the only real significant exceptions to that in the Roman period would have been uh, ancient Judaism And then the Jesus movement and what became Christianity coming out of that Jewish matrix. Again, the gods and and religion is primarily um, a corporate thing. You get gods given to you with your birth certificate. So depending on the city in which you're born, the tribe in which you're born, the ethnos in which you're born, gods come with that. The gods are tied to, to lands and to people and to cities. So if you are born into that city, that land, that that nation, You get the gods as part of the package. And that is your unquestioned center of your religious life, which means that fulfilling your religious responsibilities is as much about demonstrating that you are a loyal member of that family, that city, or that ethnos. It's very much a a social activity, demonstrative of your solidarity with that social unit. It sounds like there's nothing at all private about it. It sounds as like it's more like uh, modern citizenship. If I just decide I don't feel like being an American today, well, that, that's too bad. Like, I... there, there, there was a time. It's, it's probably passing now. But you know, there was a time, perhaps particularly in the Deep South. You know, up until I don't know, maybe the 1960s, even when um, you know many, many Southern towns, you found it very much worth your while to show up in church, whether you believed in anything or not. There are still places like this. I've been to them. You ran a car dealership and you wanted people to buy your cars or you had a hardware store and you wanted people to frequent it. Yeah. It was not in your interest to declare yourself an atheist or mm-hmm. or a Buddhist or anything else other than sort of a church-going Christian of some sort. Mm-hmm. It was just simply a way of getting on in the society. But in the Roman world, I don't know that people felt you know that kind of intimidation uh, it was just much more of a natural thing that, uh, you know, that periodically when it was time to join in as a loyal member of the city and show proper appreciation to the guardian spirit or guard, guardian deity of the city, you did so. It was just part of what it was. Again, 
we think of politics and religion and political loyalty and so on as separable things, but those those are the categories that we work with. And in some sense, we have to take a critical distance to those categories because otherwise it interferes with our ability to engage the ancient world. So people, for example, will sometimes say, if worshiping the guardian god of the city was uh, was very much a way of showing that you were a loyal member of that society, then it wasn't really religious. You think, no, no. That's your particular modern definition of what being religious is. But in the Roman world, being religious was something different, something that cannot be put within our boxes. So that's part of what, you know, being a student of ancient religion in particular is all about, is that you really have to become self-critical of these categories and allow people to be religious in the way in which they were. The other thing to say is that at the same time, there was what we would call or what I would call voluntaristic religion personal religion, private religion. Mm -hmm. And some expressions of that did involve what we would call kind of, you know, devotion, perhaps even adoration. I mean, if you read some of the texts uh, associated with Isis worship, for example, in the Roman period, it's pretty clear that, that the devotees of Isis, in many cases, seem to have been, you know, sort of awestruck with this goddess. And although Isis comes from Egypt and her devotees are originally Egyptian, into the Roman period, adherents are being recruited from various other nationalities as well. She becomes a kind of trans-local, empire-wide kind of deity with adherents all over the Roman world, adherents for whom she was not a part of their ancestral background. So, so in their case, the adoption of Isis, devotion of, of becoming an adherent of Isis was a personal act, a voluntaristic act much closer to the way in which we think of religion being a personal choice today. But here's the crucial point. If you became a follower or an adherent of Isis or Mithras or any of the other sort of voluntaristic deities of the ancient world, that had no effect whatsoever on your ancestral religious responsibilities. You, you, you didn't lay off one against the other. You didn't say, oh, I'm becoming an Isis adherent now, so I don't have to worship my ancestral gods anymore. That would never occur to you. You continued to perform all the practices and religious rites associated with your family deities, your city deities, and so on. It's just that if you became an Isis adherent, she became a kind of um, add-on to your religious repertoire, so to speak. Dr. Hurtado, I suppose it's widely known that early Christians refused to sacrifice to the traditional deities or to the living or dead emperors. But what was the big deal? You know, many of us would assume that at worst a Christian might have to excuse himself from some infrequent holiday festivities. Was abstaining from pagan worship that easy? It wasn't. In the Roman world, religion wasn't a separable sphere of life, and the gods were not something you dealt with on, you know, one day a week. I mean, we think of often in, in the modern secularized world, we think of overt religious expression as something you do on Sunday or on Sabbath or whatever, you know, primarily. And the rest of the week, you just get on with your life and your religiousness is private, perhaps, and not very visible. But in the Roman world, the gods are a part of everything. Every professional guild meeting typically opened with a libation and acknowledgement of the god or goddess that was the tutelary deity of that particular group. The meetings of city councils of cities would involve setting up the images of the city gods and reverence offered to them as part of the ceremonies. If you went to a dinner, uh, the dinner you were invited to, particularly if it involves serving meat, would be likely a meal deriving from a sacrifice offered to a god. People didn't eat meat as carelessly, so to speak, or casually as we do in, in Western, more affluent countries. You would kill an animal primarily for, for sacrifice to a deity. But when you kill the animal, you offered part of it to the deity, but the main part of the meat was then cooked up as a dinner. And so if you did that, you would invite your friends and your family, maybe somebody's birthday, maybe some uh, important occasion. And you would all gather around, probably in a dining room, in the precincts of the god or goddess to whom the sacrifice had been offered. So when you went to that kind of a dinner, you were having dinner with the god as well as with the other people. Mm -hmm. It was a dinner, but it was also a religious event. Mm -hmm. So almost all aspects of life were tinged with some kind of overt acknowledgement of deities. For example, most Roman households had family uh, gods and little shrines set up in the house 
And on a daily basis, the members of the household would be expected to gather and um, make their uh, expressions of devotion to the, to the house to the family deities, seeking their favor and protection over the household. So absenting yourself conscientiously from the worship of the gods involved having to renegotiate virtually every aspect of your social life. You had to decide, what am I going to do here? What am I going to do there? For example, if I go to the, the Fisherman's Guild meeting, when they open the meeting with, um, you know, pouring out a libation to, the, to Poseidon or whoever, what am I going to do? Stare at my fingernails? Plan to arrive late so that maybe I can miss it or what? <laughs> You would have to be asking yourself questions all the time. So, for example, if you read 1 Corinthians, where Paul, particularly chapter 8 through 10, Paul is dealing with several of just those kinds of social situations. If you go to someone's dinner, can you go? If it's the house of a pagan, can you go? Because, you know, it's apt to be a meal that in some way will derive from a sacrificial act. And Paul's answer, you know, briefly is, well, you can go to the dinner as long as he doesn't make it obvious. But if he says overtly, this meal is a meal celebrated in honor of the God or goddess so-and-so, then you can't partake. But Mm. you can't partake if he doesn't do that. In order for Christians to try to remain part of their families and part of their social groups and professional groups, they couldn't simply withdraw to the desert or set up separate communities. They, They had to remain part of the social fabric and activities of their world, and yet every aspect of their social life was tinged with something to do with the gods. So from the Christian point of view, it was a real minefield to navigate. There was just always something coming up that you weren't sure if you were really supposed to do that. It must have been also very complicated from the pagan side. How did they perceive these persnickety early Christians? The information that survives tends to be from people like um, Chalcis and, and from other people who who engaged in an out, outright critique of Christians. It, it looks as though... Christians were regarded as obnoxious at best, and at worst, socially and politically uh, deviant. It appears that they would have got a lot of um, harassment and expressions of distaste, probably most frequently and perhaps most poignantly from members of their own family and close acquaintances, because these people, we're talking particularly about, um, say, pagan converts to early Christianity, You know, at one point in their life, they're born, they're brought up, they are participating in the worship of their family gods, their city gods, and so on. And maybe at one point, you know, then what? Um, A month later, a week later, after a certain point, after they become convinced of the Christian message, and they're told, well, you must now abstain from uh, participating in worshiping the gods. At one point, They are what they are. They are a loyal member of their family and everything. And then if they become a Christian, suddenly, it would seem, they start getting awkward. And their families and their friends, you know, who wouldn't understand this, must have thought to themselves, what the devil is going on here? Who do you think you are? Or what has come over you? You know, have you become uh, possessed by some alien intelligence or what? If you put yourself in the position of the non-Christian or pagan family members or associates, you could see that it would be really difficult to comprehend because taking up a new God, that wasn't a problem. So if somebody came along and said, I've, I've got this new God, his name is Jesus, most people would have said, well, that's interesting, bring him to the party. That, that wasn't a problem. He said, I become a, you know, I've, I've got interest, I've developed an interest in ISIS or I've developed an interest in Mithras or whatever. Was, oh, well, that's interesting. I've heard about it. Tell me more. But the Christians didn't just announce a new deity. These pagan adherents didn't just say, by the way, I've taken on a new deity. It was, I've taken on this deity, this God and his son Jesus, and to the exclusion of all other gods. That did not compute. That just, that just didn't factor in the religious logic of the Roman world. And so Christians were perceived as really, you know, uh, as they say, uh, behaving in an obnoxious and socially deviant kind of way. You can see that from some of the language used against them. One of the terms used against them is, you know, haters of mankind. Mm. Uh, One of the other terms that's used is atheists. Because again, the Roman world did not compute, did not deal with, you know, um, an exclusive attachment to a god. Uh, You were either observant of the gods, altogether or not. 
in the grammar of religiousness of the time, so to speak, there was no room for a person saying, I, I'm devoted to this God to the exclusion of all others. It was, no, no, there are the gods, so you, you, it's all or nothing. And the early Christians who claimed to worship a God, but who rejected the gods, a lot of people just said, you know, it seems to have taken the view, you're a phony, you're actually behaving in an atheistic manner. So impiety, irreligiousness, atheism, and social deviance, these were the kinds of categories with which Christians um, were clothed by their, by their observers quite a lot. In our present-day terminology, it sounds like they perceive them to be members of uh, what we would call a toxic cult, yeah. which is antisocial, anti-family, and with uh, overtones of sedition almost. Yes, and this is why when you read the early Christian texts, letters of Paul, but also letters, uh, texts like 1 Peter, for example, which, which goes into a lot of specifics about how Christians should comport themselves in their society, the pastoral letters also, and then subsequent writings like the letter to Diognetus, a second century text. Frequently in these texts, there are exhortations to Christians to demonstrate uh, warmth and affection and solidarity with uh, their family, to be good citizens, to you know reverence the emperor, to pay their taxes, etc., to avoid being found guilty of any kind of crime, and if you're a slave, to be a good slave to your pagan master. If you're a Christian wife married to a pagan husband, to be as good a wife as you can. They're trying constantly, it appears, to avoid as much as possible any excuse to be treated as antisocial, mm -hmm. to sort of offset what they know is going to be unavoidably the harassment and the disfavor that they're going to experience on account of their faith. So they go out of their way in other ways to try to uh, be uh, cooperative good citizens. Unless we understand the situation, by the way, in which Christians were in, when we read those exhortations today, we'll be inclined to say, oh, this is really objectionable. This guy's telling people that they should be subservient and they should be, you know, obedient to their master or obedient to their husband or, you know, uh, be, be good citizens. Oh, this is uh, social conservatism. This mm -hmm. is just, you know, this is just a bunch of social conservatives trying to seek conformity, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, it isn't that. These are people who are trying, as they say, to offset the unavoidable opprobrium and harassment that Christians are going to take by trying to, in some sense, keep as low a profile as they can to avoid any unnecessary reason for offense. So 1 Peter, you know, says, you know, avoid making any kind of uh, crime or anything that would, that would generate any charge against you for criminal behavior. See to it, you know, basically that if you, if you are called to account, the only reason you're called to account is for the name of Jesus. I have, just to give an illustration, modern illustration, if I may, I won't name names, but I had a recent uh, PhD student who was from Hong Kong, and I asked her on one occasion, is your family Christian? And she said, no, my family are traditional uh, Chinese religion. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, I said, uh, how does that work for you as a member of the family? And she said, well, when the family gets together for family operations, they will gather and they will have images or photographs of the ancestors at the front, and people go up to make their offerings to the ancestors, to reverence the ancestors. She said, I go to those events, and I stand at the back. I don't go up and I don't go up and make an offering. I stand at the back. And it's my way of saying, I can't participate in the reverence of these beings, but I'm here. I'm a member of this family. That's one way, and it's contemporary, right, right now, of how that person was was having to sort of negotiate her existence as a Christian member, but wanting still to be part of her pagan family. And that's illustrative, I think, of the way in which, um, which Christians typically had to negotiate their existence in the Roman world. So she wants to hang on to all of her ethnic identity she can, but still some things are just absolutely cut off. Who knows? But in that situation, family members might say, you are not a loyal member of this family. You no longer are part of this family. You, you know, if you don't reverence the family gods, you are a secessionist. You know, you're seceding from the family. And under those situations, she and I think many other Christians in the Roman period were attempting to say, no, I'm not seceding from the family. I still am a part of this family, but I cannot participate in the reverence of the family gods. 
By the way, that illustrates the point that I try to make in one of the chapters in the book. And that is that, again, to use our terminology, not the, not the ones that were used then, it can be said, I think, that early Christianity, in effect, invents what we would call a separate religious identity, the category of a separate religious identity. Mm-hmm. Because early Christian faith says you're to remain a member of your family, you remain what you are, you keep your citizenship, your ethnic identity, and so on, but you uh, disassociate yourself from all of the gods and divine beings that mark that identity, but you you maintain it anyway, but now your religious activity is to be confined solely to this one God. And effectively, what that does is to make a conceptual distinction between your social ties, your political ties and identity, and your religious identity. Now, again, religious identity, social identity are modern terms, but they're for real phenomena. They're terms that we use to, to mark real phenomena in the Roman world. And my argument is that early Christianity, by making this separation, in effect, creates what we would call a, a, the category of a separate religious identity. By contrast, if you are attracted to Judaism in the Roman world and you really want to become a full com, uh, convert to the God of Israel, you become a proselyte. And what is involved there, says Philo of Alexandria in the first century, for example, is you forsake your family, you forsake your nation, and you become a member of the Jewish people. So you change ethnicity. And notice again how the gods are tied to ethnicity. So if you want to really join to the God of Israel, you become a member of the Jewish people. But early Christianity says, no, you stay what you are, but you can become a true adherent and fully acceptable adherent of the God of Israel without becoming a Jew, without changing ethnicity. And so that's the point at which it seems to me you have a a strong conceptual distinction between religious identity, your religious responsibility, and your ethnicity. I'm glad you brought up the case of Judaism. Again, from our point of view, you would think, well, the Romans were well familiar with the Jews, so what's the big deal? You know, okay, the Jesus worshiping Jesus and alongside God, that's new, but I mean, otherwise, they're very similar to the Jews, you know, in avoiding all kinds of idolatry and being, uh, you know, picky about food, even things like that. Why, why couldn't they just say to themselves, hey, th- these are just a slightly different kind of Jews? Why was it so different to them? Uh, The crucial difference, I think, is if you keep in mind that in the Roman world, religion is characteristically tied to ethnicity. The gods are dominantly tied to lands and to people. So the Roman world found Jewish exclusivism, the refusal to Jewish refusal to worship the gods, objectionable. And it's commented on as objectionable by numerous uh, pagan authors and writers of the time. Mm -hmm. But they were finally able to sort of hold their nose and accepted, so to speak, because it was a part of Jewish ethnicity. Hmm. This, in their minds, pig-headed, bloody-minded Jewish exclusivism. But what the heck, it's what Jews do. It's their national custom. So they could forgive a lot, so to speak, or if not forgive, at least accept (laughs) accept a lot, a Roman's good, so long as it had the legitimacy of being part of an ethnic identity. Similarly, Jews and other people criticize, for example, the Egyptians because their gods are uh, <clears throat> are figured as uh, as animals. You know, they have uh, dog-headed gods, and they have you know they worship cats and they worship you know cows. And so the Jews and and Greeks and Romans thought this was terrible. This is ridiculous because everybody knows that gods that are really worth the name of have to have human form. I mean, all the Greek <laughs> gods are human forms. The Roman gods are human form. Yeah. And Jewish god doesn't have an image, but they they speak of him and sort of you know in kind of human character, you know, he's like a a great warrior or whatever. But these stupid Egyptians have these animal gods. And they just thought this was ridiculous. But, you know, it's it's the Egyptian thing. So leave them alone. The Romans are quite ready to tolerate enormous religious variety in the empire that they ruled and accepted uh, the ways of different people as, you know, an aspect of their ethnicity. But in the case of early, early Christianity, this wasn't a separate 
ethnicity. It was perceived as, for one thing, a new religious movement. It didn't have ethnic legitimacy because, as I say, it wasn't um, it wasn't the religion of a particular uh, nation. It was trans-ethnic in its makeup, adherents made up from various nations, and there was no responsibility to take up the ethnic ways of any group. You kept your ethnicity, you kept your customs and your family relationships and your uh, identity and so on, but you were to desist from your gods now and take up this new god. It was uh, different. Jewish uh, cultic exclusivity was associated with Jewish ethnicity. Early Christianity had no such association or legitimacy. There must have been alarm also because once Christians weren't, you know, less than 1% of the populace, once they were 10 or 20%, they must have thought that they were losing people to this weird group, sort of taking Romans from Rome. Yes, I think that, um, uh, you know, we we don't have any figures, and there, there are lots of sort of by gosh and by golly estimates that most of us work with, some of which I mentioned in my book. Mm-hmm. So it's, you know, it's thought that maybe by roughly 200 AD, there may have been, I don't know, a couple of hundred thousand Christians. We don't know how many, but it was, you know, a couple of hundred thousand out of maybe 50 million in the Roman Empire. So a very small percentage of people. But two or three things made early Christianity worrisome and progressively so. Uh, One, at a very early point, even in the first century, is this cultic exclusivity. That is, the early Christians refused to participate in the worship of the gods. And because acknowledging the gods is a constituent part of all areas of, of social and political life, that created tensions, seismic tensions, immediately at the level of individuals and their relationships. And so we, we have these records of, you know, uh, Paul's reference in 1 Thessalonians, writing to the Thessalonian church of his converts there in Thessalonica, already receiving a lot of harassment and buffeting and tribulation from their society, from their family, and so on. It's pretty clear that, that the repercussions of Christian faith set in immediately, but very much at, at, the, at the local level and at the level of individual family units and, you know, and, and those relationships. By the early second century, at the and probably earlier, but by the early second century, we have textual evidence, particularly the, the the famous letter of Pliny, the Roman governor, writing sometime in the early second century, about 110 or so, writing to the emperor Trajan about um, how he's handled those who have been denounced to him as Christians in what is now part of um, northern Turkey in Bithynia and Pontus. Pliny says that he already knows that Christians have been put on trial elsewhere, but he claims not to be familiar with the actual conduct of these proceedings. So. At that point, it's interesting, Christians are not only getting harassment and creating tensions with their family and associates, but are being brought to the attention of local magistrates, such as Pliny, and being denounced. One of the reasons there, one of the additional reasons seems to be, again connected with Christian exclusivism, it's hinted at in Pliny's letter because Pliny says that, you know, he's taking uh, what he believes to be effective action against those denounced to him as Christian, and he says, I'm quite sure that my firm action will restore the temples that have been neglected and the business associated with the temples, the, the raising of animals and the making of, you know, of souvenirs, of shrines, of little ex voto uh, objects and so on that were all a part of the business of temple, that the revenue and the activities of the temples will be rejuvenated once my actions kick in. So that suggests that one of the bases for the uh, denunciation of Christians was their real or imagined effect of their cultic exclusivism. How many people does it take? If, if your livelihood depends upon a pagan temple, you know, let's say you are, you're an artisan making little images of the goddess of this temple and selling them. Mm-hmm. Or let's say you're a farmer raising sacrificial animals under license for sacrifice in the temple. How many people does it take for you to get angry? Uh, how many people desisting from the worship of that goddess and saying, uh, even if not shouting it in the street, saying amongst their family and friends, I don't go to the temple anymore because I don't consider that goddess worthy of worship anymore. She's really an imposter. She doesn't deserve it. I worship the one true God, and therefore I'll have nothing to do with that deity anymore. How many people like that would it take for you to really get angry and for you to feel, wait a minute, that guy is threatening my livelihood? Yeah, not too many. I mean, if it's a direct hit on your income. People say, oh, well, Pliny's probably exaggerating when he says, you know, the the now vacated temples will be, well, maybe he was exaggerating. Okay, wouldn't be the first politician to do that. (laughs) 
But it suggests that to me that even if the effect wasn't nearly as great as he was saying, the feared effect of Christians was at least a motivating factor. And so probably the denunciations that were coming to him, because uh, Pliny doesn't go out looking for Christians. He says people have been denounced to him, and, and so he's had to haul them in and put them on trial. The denunciations or identification of people as Christians probably coming from neighbors and perhaps family members and others who were really angry and feeling that their family member or their associate was just um, uh, totally disloyal. But it could also have been from people whose livelihood depended upon the operation of the pagan temples who feared that their livelihood would be endangered by this small cult group that was, that, it, that it was well known were withdrawing from the worship of the gods and encouraging other people to do the same thing. So there were, you know, economic reasons were probably a factor as well in the tensions that Christians were creating. Then across the second century, to judge from the uh, from the literature, uh, writings by Celsus, for example, this full-scale critique that was written in sometime around 170 or so AD, uh, and other pagan writings of the time uh, that are that are attacking Christianity. My hunch is the only reason a sophisticate like Celsus would engage in the time and energy and efforts involved doing the research and the writing of this book attacking Christianity. Why would anybody do that? I mean, that would be like, I don't know, I date myself a bit, but it would be like Gore Vidal, you know, writing some sort of full scale <laughs> critique of a religious group. Why mm -hmm. would anybody like that do that? They've, mm -hmm. they've got too many cocktail parties to go to and other things to deal with. <laughs> right. um, the reason probably is because at that point, Christianity was beginning to make inroads into the wrong kind of social classes, so to speak. And by that, I mean social classes in the upper ranges of Roman society. Kelsa says the only Christians are really sort of ignorant women and children and slaves and nobodies. If that were really the case, Kelsus would not have invested so much energy in trying to refute it. The reason that Kelsus gets concerned and that other people such as Marcus Aurelius, the emperor, becomes concerned, rough contemporary, uh, is that I think because Christians at that point, Christianity at that point is beginning to make converts in some of the equestrian class, the sort of upper classes, and perhaps even among senatorial class of the Roman world. And then by the third century, Tertullian and, uh, and other church fathers of this time refer to uh, Christianity as in some towns, the majority of the population in some areas and significant parts of the population in others. So it does look as though in the third century in particular, the numerical growth of Christianity continues sort of like compound interest. You know, I mean, it, it grows on a certain percentage basis every year, but numerically that really becomes significant by the third century. Dr. Hurtado, somewhere towards the end of the book, you say, well, you might wonder, given all that I've been discussing, you know, given all the trouble that you have to go to in this type of society to become a Christian, you might wonder why people did it. <laughs> yeah. But you say, I'm not going to get into that. I'm sure there's some very interesting ideas there, even just on the level of history and sociology, why this spread as well as it did. Is this something that you hope to get into in the future? Well, as it happens, I was uh, offered an opportunity to uh, give a lecture in Marquette University in the spring and took it up and devoted my lecture uh, and a small monograph that, that is attached to the lecture. It's a small book entitled, Why on Earth Did Anyone Become a Christian in the First Three Centuries? That appeared in April of this year, published by Marquette University Press. Wonderful. I didn't know about that. I'll have to check that out. Yeah, it's available you know, on <laughs> Amazon or wherever. Uh-huh. Great. Um, the, the major thrust of that lecture and of that small book is precisely to emphasize uh, this question. Given what we know to have been 
the negative consequences, both social consequences from family, friends, associates, and so on, and the political consequences then from magistrates and growing on into the third century with imperial pogroms against Christian, particularly, of course, culminating in Diocletian's great pogrom, the worst one perhaps in 303. But given all these um, negative consequences, what was it that made it worth a while for people to become Christians? Because Christianity is growing all through this period, growing apace and spreading geographically and spreading vertically up through, it appears, up through the social classes as well. So mm-hmm. even even people with social status are becoming Christians. So you can't explain it easily on sort of, you know, deprivation theory that, mm-hmm. you know, people were didn't have any money, didn't have any status, so they became a Christian instead. Well, that first of all, that's never made any sense to me, but it wouldn't make any sense for somebody of the equestrian or senatorial ranks, certainly. So it's a question that I think has not been adequately posed. Instead, what has happened is that historians, great historians from Harnack and, and, and earlier and afterward, uh, Rodney Stark and others, have tended to ask questions this way, why did Christianity grow? And so they've looked at sort of, you know, well, Christianity grew perhaps because it was, you know, effective at communicating its message. Or Christianity grew because it had high moral values. Or Christianity grew because people were willing to die for their faith. Or any number of reasons that have been offered. And those are all valid questions to put and valid uh, things to explore. But what I try to do in the in the lecture and in the book is to say, let's bring it down to the level of an individual. Not why did this movement grow collectively, but why on earth did any individual choose to become a Christian given the personal costs involved in doing so. So I try to press the question really hard and in the book, in that little book discuss a lot of the social and political consequences involved. If I may say so, I think that scholars, and I don't mean to, to uh, put down the enormous scholarly efforts that have been invested in dealing with the rise of early Christianity, but I, I think that some of the reasons that have been given are a bit banal and mm-hmm. not terribly impressive. Because I think the question has not, the nettle has not been grasped fully. And the question has not been faced as directly as I wanted to put it in that book, which is, here are the consequences. Here are the reasons not to be a Christian. And they are considerable. Why on earth would you pay that kind of cost? What were you hoping to get? Now, the alternatives are, obviously, people were just, uh, the people who became Christians were irrational fruitcakes who just uh, were stupid people. And you think, hmm, that's hard to, that's hard to make that a global characterization of, of, of the growth of Christianity across the first three centuries. But either people were unthinking stupid, or else, if they were reasonable people at all, they must have thought that there was something that was offered, some sort of goods, so to speak, that were offered by Christian faith and participation in Christian faith that made it worthwhile to pay the social and potential political costs involved. Toward the end of that lecture and that book, I sketch a few tentative attempts to throw some answers at it. But my main point in writing that little book was to say, this is an important question. We need to try to wrestle with this question some more. Here are a few tentative uh, initial reasons for it, but uh, there's probably much more to be said. I mean, one of the things that I suggest in the book is Christian uh, beliefs. Christian beliefs, I think, were were a factor. Mm Mm-hmm. In a world in which, as I say, the gods are not something that you characteristically relate to in a personal, relational kind of way, uh, typically, the Christian emphasis on God as loving humankind is very hard to find a match for that. I've been scouring for a few years now, trying to scour as much as I can, sources about, you know, reference discourse about the Roman and Greek gods and various deities of the time. I can't really find any equivalent discourse to the Christian discourse about their God loving humankind and the basis of this God's action of redemption or creation and so on being motivated by love. You have references to the gods often being merciful, bountiful, generous, and that sort of thing. But it's very, very hard to find references to the the Roman era gods uh, in terms of love, either God's loving or loving the gods in return. There's actually one incident that I came across where a philosopher and a student are discussing it and the student says to the philosopher, should we love the gods? And the philosopher answers back, well, no, 
because then the gods would have to love us, and that's stupid. <laughs> Interesting. Um, in comparison to that, the discourse about the Christian God loving humankind and loving the world and you know and so on and so on. I mean, that's just ubiquitous. Just uh, look at almost any writing in the New Testament. Right. And the God discourse, so to speak, is just shot through with references to God's love. So all that to say, one factor is this is this is a very striking different factor. And in that world, I'm just wondering whether uh, that would have been very appealing to people. If you were convinced, you became convinced through Christian preaching that there was one God who had created all things and one God who ruled over all of the other spirits and deities, whatever they were, and one God ultimately who was in charge of everything and who countermanded everything else, and that you could relate to this God personally, you could talk to this God personally, and that the basis of that relationship was that this God loved you. I think that for some people that would have been heady stuff. Yeah, on the face of it, that's a powerful message that any human being could relate to. And the promise of eternal life. Most pagans didn't expect to live forever. You know, the famous thing that you see on Roman gravestones, uh, I was not, I was, I am not, I care not. Hmm. Quite common, and, and so common that often it's sort of abbreviated with just the, 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 the initial letters on the gravestone. And so most people didn't entertain the notion of eternal life, at least not any kind of living, vibrant thing. Uh, the early Christian message promises uh, resurrection and eternal life and a very vibrant notion of eternal life, you know, not sitting in the Elysian fields, you know, uh, looking at the flowers, but actually quite vibrant uh, notions of eternal life. So. I think that one aspect that, that has often been downplayed by historians uh, and, and social scientists is the ideology, so to speak, or the beliefs of early Christianity. But I think that early Christian beliefs, ideological things in that sense, were a factor. There probably were, were uh, various factors, different combinations of them for different people who became Christians. But as I say, the main point in that book is to say, I think we ought to focus the question that way and to ask, why, given the considerable disincentives for being a Christian, did people become Christians nevertheless? Well, you say the literature's in a not very developed state. Based on your past history, I would think you're not going to be satisfied with your initial uh, attempts. I bet you're going to dig farther into this. So I look forward to seeing that. I hope so. If, if uh, there's time and maybe I can elicit uh, some teamwork as well, we see what we can come up with. Dr. Hurtado, thanks for talking with us. My pleasure. Again, the book is called Destroyer of the Gods, Early Christian Distinctiveness in the Roman World. And it should be available online by September 15th, 2016. Today's thinking music has been the track Warmer by Andy G. Cohen. Before we go, I want to send out my special thanks to Andrew in California for his monthly donation through PayPal, and also Isaac in Florida. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I really appreciate your help. If you'd like to make a one-time or monthly donations, just look for the orange PayPal buttons on the right side of any blog post at trinities.org. Next week, more with Dr. Hurtado about early Christianity in its societal context. More on his Destroyer of the Gods. Thanks for listening. We'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind.